Okay, uh, let's start now. Uh, my name is Roger Blunford, and um, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Martin Rees to come and give this lecture. Uh, Martin, for me personally, he was a uh, supervisor, mentor, colleague, and friend, and he is for many other people in this room. And so it, it's a great thrill for us to have him here to talk to us. Um, uh, Martin, as I'm sure many of you know, has had a distinguished career in cosmology and astrophysics, and also one in leadership at both of the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. He's been Master of Trinity College, President of the Royal Society, and he's now extremely influential in the House of Lords. And um, now, as an astrophysicist and a cosmologist over the last 50 years, Martin has been un uncommonly prophetic um, about uh, these subjects in, in cosmology. He was uh, a, an early, uh, not believer, but prover in some sense of the, the Big Bang as a student, and at a time when that was and still an issue, and that matters of dark matter, which many of you heard about, about galaxy formation, what we now sometimes call the cosmic dawn and so on. He's been writing the papers and seeing, understanding things way ahead of everybody else. Um, in um, uh, in astrophysics, uh, famous for his work on black holes, on neutron stars, uh, on blazers and quasars and pulsars, gamma ray bursts, uh, and re more recently he's become interested in exoplanets and especially the search for life um, outside the solar system. Uh, and that is in fact is why he's here, has been um, uh, talking, he gave a, a wonderful talk this morning uh, to the Breakthrough Foundation meeting on these topics here at Stanford. So, uh, uh, so the really good news is we have, we're going to listen to a lecture by someone who has been remarkable in his record of uh, scientific divination and understanding what we're going to learn. Uh, the bad news is that he's also been writing a lot uh, about um, uh, existential threats which we all face on the earth and, um, and the list as you may have noticed you read the newspaper has been getting somewhat longer <laughs> so as a sort of modern day successor to Cassandra and Jonah and Nostradamus uh, he has uh, been telling us all, all the things that um, could go wrong and providing in, in my book very cogent um, arguments for uh, an urgency for public action, and he's still tireless in doing that. So, um, though set, set aside the problems of the Earth this evening for the next hour or so, and he's going to tell us about the problems instead of the universe and beyond, and, he, and Martin Rees' title is From Mars to the Multiverse. So, thank you, Martin, for coming to give us this talk, and we look forward to very much to hearing from you. Well, thank you, Walter, for these flattering half-truths about me. <laughs> uh, well, uh, why do we do astronomy? I want to give four reasons. First, to explore what's out there. Then to interpret phenomena in terms of physics, maybe even new physics. And then to understand cosmic evolution or development from some beginning to its present complexity of stars, planets, and people. And fourthly, can we understand at a deeper level why things are the way they are? And I'm going to start with exploration, past and future. But first, uh, a bit of history. Um, this is uh, Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, uh, Roger Blanford was a very good student, but the best student we ever had is this man here. And Roger wasn't nearly as good. Yeah. Um, and uh, I show Newton because he must have thought about space travel. This is a famous illustration from uh, uh, his English version of Principia, showing cannonballs being fired from a mountaintop, and he calculated that to get them into an orbit, you have to fire them at 18,000 miles an hour, far beyond what was then possible. This is still, I think, the neatest way to explain uh, to students the concept of orbital flight. It wasn't until 1957 that this speed was achieved, by the uh, uh, Soviet Sputnik, and only 12 years later, we had uh, this iconic picture, and then we had the Apollo landings. This was signed for me a few years ago by some of the Apollo astronauts. Well, 
You've got to be middle-aged to remember when this happened. <laughs> Manned space flight has languished, limited ever since to low Earth orbit on the space station. But space technology, of course, as we know, has burgeoned. We use it every day. And for decades now, unmanned probes have been back pictures of varied and distinctive worlds. There they are. You see many of these, but here's the red planet, and this is the Curiosity probe, which has been trundling around the surface of some big crater for the last five years. And you can see near the bottom there the, uh, the track marks it's making going across. It's traveled about 15 miles so far. And then, going further out, uh, here's uh, Jupiter. And um, some wonderful pictures of Jupiter from Juno, a recent probe showing the um, uh, sort of complicated whirlpools. This is near the north pole of Jupiter. Rather fascinating recent picture. And then we get to Saturn. Oh, before that, these are the, uh, the moons of Jupiter. Um, all very different. Um, Io is very surface and volcanic. Uh, Europa has an icy surface and an ocean underneath it. And then Saturn's been explored by Cassini. Cassini is a real antique. It was launched more than 20 years ago and it continued until just a few months ago. Um, and uh, sending back wonderful pictures of Saturn and its moons. One of its moons is Titan. This may look a rather salubrious place, but these lakes are liquid methane. The temperature is minus 160 degrees centigrade. And here's another smaller moon of uh, Saturn, Enceladus, which again has an icy surface, an ocean underneath. And it, this has um, uh, liquid, probably water, spraying above the surface. And so many people think this is the best location for life in the solar system apart from our Earth. There could be uh, things swimming um, under the, uh, uh, this ice in some ocean. And we also have had recent measurements of a, a comet, which is Rosetta uh, from the European Space Agency, and pictures being backed by NASA's New Horizon from 10,000 times the moon's distance, pictures of Pluto. There we are, which is rather remarkable. There's one, and there's, there's another one. Well, these instruments were all last century. Cassini was built in the 1990s. The um, uh, Rosetta and New Horizons took 10 years to get to their journey. And so if you think how mobile phones and things have changed in the last 20 years, think how much better we could do and realize that our solar system can be explored by miniaturized probes much more powerful than any of these these things. But what about people? Will human explorers follow these robots? I think they will, but as adventurers rather than for practical goals. I think that what will happen is that there'll be private enterprise effort in space. We know about SpaceX and Blue Origin and the rest. And I think they will uh, have the advantage because they can tolerate higher risks and therefore cut costs. And I think the first people who will go to Mars will be going just as an adventure because robots can do the practical job just as well. So the first people on Mars will be sort of thrill seekers in the mold of, say, Felix Baumgartner, the guy who fell supersonically from a high altitude balloon, or other people who do these crazy adventures. <laughs> And I think such people will, by the end of a century, have established a base on Mars. And Elon Musk himself says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> and he's, he's, I think, 46 years old, so he'll probably make it. But don't expect mass emigration from the Earth. It's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from the Earth's problems. We've got to solve them here. Coping with climate change is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. No way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. There's no planet B for ordinary risk-averse people. But our descendants here on Earth should cheer on these space adventurers. This is why. Precisely because humans are ill-adapted to Mars and space, those people who are out there will have more incentive than us on Earth to redesign themselves. 
harnessing the super powerful genetic and cyber technology that will be developed by 2100. These techniques will be heavily regulated, one hopes, on Earth, but the Martians will be far beyond the clutches of the regulators. <laughs> so it's these spacefarers, not those of us comfortably adapted to life on Earth, who will spearhead the post-human era, evolving within a few centuries into a new species. Well, organic humans like us need a planetary surface. But if these post-humans make the full transition to being cyborgs or uh, electronic, then, of course, they won't need an atmosphere. And they may prefer zero G, especially for constructing massive artifacts. So, even if intelligence were now unique to the Earth, it needn't remain a cosmic sideshow. Embodied in generations of self-improving machines, advancing by intelligent design, not by Darwinian selection, it could, during these future aeons, explore far beyond the solar system. Interstellar voyages would hold no terrors for near immortals. So, if SETI searches detect anything, I think it won't be a civilization of organic creatures like us. It'll be something electronic wandering into interstellar space. But is there intelligence beyond the Earth already? There will be descended from us in the far future. And perhaps the hottest topic in astronomy is the realization that many other stars, perhaps even most, are orbited by retinues of planets like the Sun is. These planets are not detected directly, but they're inferred by precise measurements of their parent star. In particular, by looking for transits, looking for the way a star would dim slightly if a planet moves across in front of it. And there have been many discoveries this way. One of the most remarkable uh, is uh, this miniature solar system called TRAPPIST-1. Seven planets in orbit around an M dwarf star, a star which is 100 times fainter than our sun, and these planets have orbits ranging from two days to about two weeks, so their years are very short. If you lived on one of these, it would be rather spectacular, because uh, uh, the others would plan to move across the sky, being as big as a full moon in our sky. Some may be tightly locked, presenting the same face to the star all the time. So there'd be kind of apartheid. Everyone would live on the sunny side, except the astronomers back on the other side. <laughs> well, to show the evidence for this, this is the data from the Spitzer telescope on all the transits. So you can see that they've observed many, many transits. There's no doubt about them. Uh, and you, you can infer um, from the, the transits, um, you can infer the uh, size of the, of the planet from the fraction of the light it blocks out. And you can, of course, infer the length of its year from the periodicity of these. The um, spacecraft named after Kepler looked for three and a half years at a patch of sky about seven degrees across and found, uh, it, it observed 150,000 stars and found many thousand planets by this transit method. Um, they're illustrated in, in this rather silly cartoon here, uh, which uh, uh, shows a lot of the uh, planets found, scale by the length of their year and the size of the planets. We're especially interested, of course, in twins of our Earth. Planets the same size as ours, on orbits with temperatures such that water neither freezes nor boils all the time. And the real goal, of course, is not merely to find evidence for these, but to see them directly, not just to infer them. But that's hard. To realize how hard, let's suppose that an alien astronomer was looking from, say, 30 light years away at our solar system with a big telescope. From that distance, the sun would look like an ordinary star, and the Earth would look in Carl Sagan's last phrase, as a pale blue dot, very close in the sky to its star, our sun, and billions of times fainter. But if the aliens could 
observed that pale blue dot carefully, they could learn quite a bit about it. Because the shade of blue would be slightly different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Asia was facing them. So they could learn there were continents and oceans, they could learn the length of the day, they could learn something of the climate and seasons, and by analysing the lights they could perhaps infer that the atmosphere had oxygen, etc. in it. Well, we can't do that yet, but within 10 years or so we'll be able to do this. Possibly with JWST, but certainly with this telescope which the Europeans are building in Chile. It's called the Extremely Large Telescope. <laughs> Europeans aren't very imaginative in their nomenclature. And it has a uh, mosaic mirror 39 meters across. That's, I guess, nearly twice the width of this, this room, uh, made over 800 pieces. And this instrument will allow us to draw inferences like those I imagined about planets the size of the Earth orbiting other sun-like stars. And if we look at the nearest ones, of course, but there are very many. In our galaxy, we know that most stars have planets around them, and roughly one in six has a planet like the Earth, the Earth's size and in the so-called habitable zone. But habitable doesn't mean inhabited. We still don't know the likelihood of life. We know too little about how it began on Earth to lay confident odds. We don't know what triggered the transition from complex molecules to entities that can metabolize and reproduce. It might have been a fluke, or this crucial transition might have been almost inevitable given the right environment. We just don't know, do, nor do we know if the DNA, RNA chemistry of terrestrial life is the only possibility, or whether other options could be realized elsewhere. Moreover, even if simple life is widespread, we can't assess the odds that it evolves into a complex biosphere. It might just remain simple life. And even if it did, it might be unrecognizably different from our kind of life. I won't hold my breath, but SETI programs are a worthwhile gamble because success in the search would carry the momentous message that concepts of logic and physics aren't limited to the hardware in human skulls. And the Breakthrough Listen program bankrolled by the Russian investor Yuri Milner just down the road, has pledged $10 million a year for 10 years to expand searches for evidence of some artificial transmission. And this is a much deeper search and a more varied type of search in all wave bands than has been done before. I should mention, of course, that there are people who think they know the answer already. I get letters from people who say they've been visited or abducted. Uh, and uh, I say two, two things to these people. Uh, first, do they really think that if the aliens had made the huge effort to come here, would they just have made a corn circle and met one or two well-known cranks and gone away again? <laughs> it doesn't seem likely. The second thing I say is, would they please write to each other and not to me? <laughs> well, back now to stars and galaxies themselves far simpler than biology. We know we are in the Milky Way galaxy, and if we could get, say, three million light years away from our Earth and look back at it, look back at our Milky Way, it would look like this. This, of course, is Andromeda, the nearest big galaxy to us, a spinning hub viewed obliquely with 100 billion stars orbiting uh, around a centre uh, where there lurks a massive black hole. And, as you know, there are a whole variety of galaxies, different shapes and sizes. And we have huge samples to study. This is a, uh, a map of the galaxies within a few hundred million light years, and you see they're grouped into clusters, and a great deal is known about this. Now, you might think it's very hard for us to learn very much about galaxies, because we can't do experiments on them. Uh, if you're a particle physicist, you would crash things together, and see what happens, um, but of course we can't uh, um, do this on galaxies. And moreover, they change so slowly, the orbital time for the sun around the galactic centre is 200 million years, and we just see a snapshot. But we can do experiments in the virtual world of our computer. And here's just one example of what happens if two galaxies fall together under, under gravity. 
you get a sort of train wreck um, and where the stars all phase mix and these two galaxies eventually will settle down into an amorphous elliptical galaxy. And this is a real picture of two galaxies uh, which have got dangerously close. One has pulled out a tidal plume on the other and having looked at pictures like this and done simulations like I showed, you can learn something about what's happening. And you can also do simulations for different assumptions about the amount of stars, gas and dark matter and see which fits best and thereby learn quite a bit about the uh, properties of galaxies. And just as a warning, uh, the Andromeda galaxy is going to crash into our Milky Way, rather like in that movie, in about four billion years. So that's a warning. <laughs> the other way we can learn about galaxies is by using the fact that if we look a long way away, we can look back in the past. And we can see, therefore, what galaxies were like in the past, and not now, and our theories have to fit that as well as the present data. This picture shows a small patch of sky, a patch of sky that would show nothing looked at through a modest-sized telescope. But here it shows literally hundreds of little smudges. All of them are galaxies, many fully the equal of our Milky Way, but looking so small and faint because of their distances. There are many of them more than 10 billion light years away. We're seeing them when they're young and recently formed. We're looking back to when the universe was about a tenth of its present age. But what about still further back, before there were galaxies? Well, here again, uh, we had no idea until 50 or 60 years ago, um, but uh, the clearest evidence came in 1965 from these two people, Penges and Wilson, who showed that intergalactic space wasn't completely cold. It's warmed to three degrees above absolute zero by microwaves which fill all of space. And later work showed that those microwaves have a black body spectrum. The intensity as a function of frequency is a uh, black body, which is a spectrum indicative of having been made in a sort of heat bath, rather like inside the sun. So this implies that in the early universe, everything was hot and dense like the inside of the sun, and this radiation uh, came to this kind of equilibrium. As the universe expanded and cooled, the radiation got diluted, it got stretched, the wavelength shifted uh, down into the microwaves, um, but it still fills the universe, there's nowhere else to go. And so this is the, as it were, afterglow of creation, the adiabatically cooled and diluted relic of when everything was squeezed hot and dense. And it's one of several lines of evidence which have allowed us to firm up the hot big bang story. And here's a uh, rather crude time chart of the, uh, the big bang, uh, tracing back to a second and to even earlier times. But before going further, let me address a fundamental question. Our present cosmos manifests a huge range of temperatures and densities from blazingly hot stars to the dark night sky. People sometimes worry about how so much intricate complexity can have emerged from an amorphous fireball. If I seem to violate the second law of thermodynamics, the famous law which describes an inexorable tendency for patterns and structures to decay or disperse or wash out. But the answer to this seeming paradox lies in the force of gravity. Gravity enhances density contrast. If in the expanding universe some patch is a bit denser than average, it lags behind more and more as the universe expands, and then eventually it condenses out to form a bound system. This movie, where the expansion is scaled out, shows a part of a virtual universe. So the picture stays the same size, and you can see incipient structure, which is unfolding and evolving. The blue is the dark matter, about five times more than the ordinary atoms, which are shown red. And the red atoms and the gas, they can radiate, dissipate, and form stars. So movies of this kind portray how galaxies emerged in galaxy-scale clumps, where gravity enhanced the contrast, and gas is pulled in and compressed into stars. So each galaxy is an arena within which stars, planets, and perhaps life can emerge. 
And there's one important point. The initial fluctuations fed into this computation weren't arbitrary. They're derived from observed fluctuations in the temperature of the background radiation of very early eras. This picture, taken by the Planck satellite, this is a projection of the, of the whole sky, and the, uh, um, the, the, the color coding shows some regions slightly hotter than average, some slightly cooler than average. These are the fluctuations which were present in the very early universe, and it's those fluctuations with the amplitude as a function of scale as observed here, which are put into these calculations. And the gratifying thing is that if you put in the fluctuations which were observed in the early universe and run forward <coughs> these computations, you end up with the universe rather like ours. This is just a, um, a picture presented by Max Tegmark, where the uh, continuous line shows the RMS density fluctuations as a function of scale, which you expect in a particular model, and the, um, the points are the observations from various techniques of the clusters, looking at galaxies, etc. And it's a, it's a pretty good fit, and it's a remarkable uh, link, giving us confidence that we do understand how galaxies form from these fluctuations in the very early universe. Here's the time chart of cosmic evolution again, from the hot, dense beginning to today's complex cosmos. As I said, we can trace back to one second. Indeed, we can probably be confident back to about a nanosecond. That's when each particle had about 50 GeV of energy, as much as can be achieved in the largest particle accelerator. And the entire observable universe was then squeezed down to about the size of our solar system. But questions like, where did the fluctuations come from? Why did the early universe contained the observed mix of protons, photons and dark matter, <coughs> take us right back to the even briefer earlier instance when our universe was hugely more compressed still, and when experiments offer no direct guide to the relevant physics. At this point I should insert a sort of hazard warning, <laughs> and briefly mention uh, some uh, uh, speculative issues. I'm terrified because sitting in the second row is perhaps the world's leading expert on this subject, Andre Linde. But nonetheless, I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, this magazine cover, which is quite an old one, shows the very, very early universe, actual size. <laughs> and according to the inflationary universe, the entire volume we can see with our telescope was at one stage a hyperdense blob, no bigger than that, and moreover, it had inflated from something a trillion times smaller than an atomic nucleus. Details are unclear, but the generic idea of inflation gives a compelling explanation of the scale and gross uniformity of our observable universe and how the fluctuations that led to our galaxies, which I showed on the earlier picture, how they could have been imprinted by quantum fluctuations when they were still of microscopic size. This may not be fully battle-tested, but it's much the best idea we have. Here's another fundamental question. How large is physical reality? We all know that we can only see a finite volume, a finite number of galaxies. <coughs> That's essentially because there's a horizon, a shell around us, delineating the distance light could have traveled since the Big Bang. But that's not real in any sense, any more than if you're on a boat, you don't think the horizon around you is anything specially physical. You don't think the ocean ends just beyond your horizon, and likewise, we expect that there are galaxies beyond our horizon, which we can never even in principle observe if they're accelerating away. And we don't know how far it extends. There's quite a good argument that probably it goes about a hundred or even a thousand times further than we can see. The reason for that is if you look as far as you can in that direction and in that direction, you don't see any gradient. So if we're part of some huge finite structure, it's changing very slowly over the part we can see. So probably it goes on much further. That's not a watertight argument, but that's uh, the possibility. 
Um, and it could go much, much, much further. Indeed, so far that all combinatorial options could be repeated. So very far beyond our horizon, we could all have avatars. Maybe some comfort that if you make a bad decision, there's an avatar out there who's done things differently. But be that as it may, even conservative astronomers are confident that the volume of space-time within range of our telescopes, what astronomers have normally called the observable universe, is only a tiny fraction of the aftermath of our Big Bang. And that's not all. There's something else. According to some theories, for instance, Andre Linde's eternal inflation scenario, and this is a very crude cartoon, our Big Bang could be just one island of space-time in a vast archipelago. So that sh shows bottom right, our observable universe and galaxies far beyond it, but that's just one of these, uh, these bubbles. <coughs> and this is a, a scenario uh, which has been developed in detail. And in this context, we want to ask one very important question. We know that the physical laws governing atoms and their nuclei are the same in a distant galaxy as they are in the lab. But can we assume that they are the same over this far more extensive uh, part of reality beyond what we can see? <coughs> beyond our horizon, still more in the aftermath of these other big bangs. We just don't know. It's a matter for speculation among the experts. And the challenge is to discover which branch of this decision tree is correct. First, are there many big bangs rather than just one? Second, if there are many, are they all governed by the same physical laws or not? As I said, the laws are the same everywhere we can observe, but everywhere we can observe is not the same as everywhere. So domains beyond our horizon or in different big bangs may cool down into a cosmos where the laws or constants are different. And according to string theory on which another Stanford professor, Lenny Suskind, is one of the gurus, there could be huge numbers of different vacuum states, implying different gravity, different microphysics, different atomic and nuclear physics in these different big bands. So in this grander perspective, what we used to call the laws of nature may be just as it were parochial bylaws in our cosmic patch. So this is then a very uh, uh, fundamental question in the context of these theories. Um, we can ask then uh, if the physical laws and constants vary, then what sets of laws allow complexity to evolve? Many of the patches of the universe may be sterile or stillborn because the laws are prevailing in them might not, law, might not allow the hierarchy of complexity to build up. Now, if physical reality is uh, like uh, Suskind and I think Andre Linde suspect, then there's a real motivation to explore counterfactual universes governed by different physics, to explore what range of parameters would allow complexity to emerge. And this is what's called anthropic selection. It's only fair to say that the A word makes some physicists foam at the mouth. <laughs> they think it's too far on a speculative fringe. But even they might find it helps to develop the intuition to think about what a universe might be like if the laws were different. It's like counterfactual history, where, for instance, um, uh, evolutionary biologists ask, what would have happened if the dinosaurs had to be wiped out? Would mammals and us have evolved? Or historians wonder what might have happened if the Brits had fought harder in 1776. <laughs> I think the answer to that is you'd be more like Canada. <laughs> yeah. Well, those are examples of counterfactuals. Um, and I'm going to give you three examples of counterfactual universes. Yeah. Just to see, but th th this is a, obviously a program that could be done very extensively. 
First, what would happen if all the microphysics was the same, but gravity had different strengths? Gravity is clearly crucial. <clears throat> for holding together stars and galaxies. And it's a very, very weak force. <coughs> its weakness is reflected by the fact that if you take two protons and compare the inverse square electric force between them to the inverse square gravitational force, you get a number for this like 10 to the minus 36. You get, you get 10 to the 42 if you took two electrons, but this number is a very, very number different from one, which reflects the weakness of gravity on the scale of uh, individual atoms and things. But let me show this, uh, one of my favorite pedagogical diagrams, which I was doing a paper about 40 years ago. Uh, this shows uh, along the bottom uh, um, length scale radius and on the top mass in units of the mass of the proton. And in any large object, positive and negative charges exactly cancel, but everything has the same sign of gravitational charge. So when you have enough atoms packed together, gravity wins. In this diagram, you have uh, black holes of slope one there, and you have solid objects there with slope three, uh, the uh, mass going like the radius cubed, going up there. And incidentally, because gravity is so weak, you see the black hole, the size of an atomic nucleus, has the mass of about 10 to 38 protons, there, millions of tons. Small holes are massive because gravity is weak. The solids lie on that slope at the right, sugar lumps, rocks and asteroids. And gravity is unimportant within lumps after asteroid sizes but it makes planets round, and any object more massive than Jupiter is squeezed to make a star. And on the extreme left, incidentally, is where quantum theory and gravity meet, the Planck mass, where a black hole is no bigger than the quantum fuzziness in its position. From diagrams like this, you could predict what stars were like, even if you lived on a perpetually cloud-bound planet. Was there when gravity crushes something, so that it needs to be held up by some pressure. And this is actually the uh, definition for a star, which I give for some theorist who never looked up at the sky. It's an aggregate of this number of baryons, the three halves power of that large number. Well, this is sort of straightforward physics. And I think it allows you to see what would happen if gravity had different strengths. If gravity weren't so weak, then this diagram would have the same shape, more or less, but the scaling would be, would be compressed. And you might find that objects as big as asteroids, even as big as sugar lumps, might be crushed by gravity. And this would clearly not be conducive to complexity if entities as big as us were crushed by gravity. And incidentally, stars can still exist, as gravitationally bound fusion reactors uh, in, a, uh, in a universe with strong gravity, uh, but they have shorter lifetimes. So in a universe, if gravity is too strong, there's not much space and not much time for complexity to emerge. On the other hand, what would happen if gravity were even weaker? <coughs> then stars would be bigger and they'd live much longer. And incidentally, galaxies would be bigger and would live for longer. And this universe actually uh, would have more time for complex evolution and bigger planets, etc. And so it could be that that would be a universe better. So there's no sense in which gravity is finely tuned. It just has to, be, has to be very weak in order to allow a huge gap in scales between where the micro forces are important and where gravity starts crushing things. <coughs> But what about a second counterfactual? What about the laws of the energy that keep stars shining? Just a bit about ordinary stars. Uh, we know from this time lapse about the evolution of stars. 
we know that they evolve, they use up a nuclear fuel and they die, and they leave behind them white dwarfs, neutron stars, or black holes. And here's an example. This is a place where we know as astronomers that new stars are forming in the Eagle Nebula, and we see stars die. This is what the sun will look like in about five billion years, when it leaves back behind a white dwarf and, uh, and flares up. And this is a famous object, the Crab Nebula, which is the uh, relic of a supernova explosion, the end of a massive star, which was witnessed by Chinese astronomers in the year 1054 AD. And this is important, because uh, if you were to take a slice through a star before it becomes a supernova, then you'd find it had a sort of onion skin structure, where the hotter inner layers have been heated and fused further up the periodic table. And then when it's flung out, this debris goes into interstellar space and then is recycled into new stars. And this is the way in which all the elements of which we are made were forged from pristine hydrogen. And the main people who were responsible for this uh, back in the 50s and 60s were this quartet of uh, Burbage, Jeffrey and Margaret, Willie Fowler and Fred Horne. This was a picture taken in Cambridge at Willie Fowler's birthday party. And the details of this uh, idea allowed them to understand the relative proportions of the different chemical elements, why uh, the small carbon oxygen are common, why gold and uranium are rare, and how they all came to be in our solar system. They taught us to realize that we are literally the ashes of long dead stars, if you're less romantic, we are the nuclear waste and the fuel that made the stars shine. So, the key requirement for life is nuclear fusion. Fusion power for stars, leading to a periodic table of stable elements, and those elements then allow complex chemistry in planets and in biospheres, and in us. This possibility requires, among other things, a balance between the electric forces and the strong or so-called nuclear interactions. The details of the periodic table depend on how strong the nuclear force is uh, which holds positively charged nuclei together. This is just a, a cartoon uh, showing um, a carbon atom of protons and, and neutrons, um, and uh, they're held together against the uh, repulsive electric force. Well, there's been lots of work done on tweaking the nuclear forces a bit to change the periodic table. I won't go into that, but I will take a very extreme case. Let's suppose that the nuclear force is so weak that there are no elements other than hydrogen. Let's suppose we have what I call the, the nuclear-free universe. This is a universe where uh, all, the, all the atoms are just hydrogen. Uh, well, it turns out that this universe would look much the same. If we leave everything else the same, galaxies would form, and surprisingly, stars would shine. But they'd shine by releasing gravitational energy as they contracted, going on contracting so they make white dwarfs or neutron stars. There could even be Jupiter-sized planets made of solid hydrogen. But there'd be no chemistry, no complexity, certainly no life as we know it. The only intelligence you could expect is something like Fred Hoyle's black cloud, if you know that famous story where a large magnetized cloud developed intelligence. So this sort of nuclear-free universe would resemble our actual universe only to the extent that, for instance, a marble statue resembles a real human. It would look the same from outside, but it wouldn't have any structure. So that's the second requirement. You've got to have nuclear forces to have a, um, a, uh, an anthropically large universe. And what about a third issue? What about the fluctuations? Now, if the universe was completely smooth, then now it could just consist of cold hydrogen and nothing else. As you saw, structures form from the initial fluctuations. And the fluctuation amplitude in the temperature is about one part in 10 to the fifth, 10 to the minus five. This is a number Q, which roughly speaking is 10 to the minus five. And that determines roughly the scale of structure and how tightly bound clusters of galaxies are. So let's ask what would happen if this was different. If these fluctuations were, say, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 6, or 10 to the minus 3. 
Well, if they were 10 to the minus 6, not 10 to the minus 5, we'd have what I call an anemic universe. The fluctuation would be smaller, they would take longer to condense out, they would form galaxies that were rather weakly bound, you might just have a few stars. Less than 10 to the minus 6, you wouldn't have anything at all. On the other hand, if you had 10 to the minus 4, then big structures will condense out earlier. You get huge spiral galaxies forming at high redshifts, the size of a cluster of galaxies. This might be a rather good universe to live in. Lots of, lots of stars and, lo and lots of galaxies and certainly a bigger range of structures. But if you go too far and take um, 10 to the minus 3, then probably the early universe is so violent you get lots of big black holes and no galaxies. And even larger would make the universe very lumpy. It would then be uh, that the universe would um, uh, resemble um, less a, uh, a rough ocean surface where the biggest waves are small compared to the horizon and more like a, a mountain view where one or two features dominate the, uh, dominate the, the sky and you can't really talk about averages. So there's a range, 10 to minus 4 to 10 to minus 6, uh, which is anthropically allowed. So I've just shown these three examples to indicate there's, there's no sort of special fine-tuning, but if we had this whole ensemble of universes popping off, uh, then uh, uh, the strength, strength of gravity, the nuclear force, and the roughness of the early universe uh, would have to uh, be constrained within certain ranges. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the kind of universe which not really we couldn't live in, but in which complexity couldn't emerge. In fact, I, uh, I wrote a book um, some time ago, um, sorry, <laughs> there, there, uh, which um, uh, called Just Six Numbers, where I, I discussed six numbers like this and how uh, their value depended or uh, determined the nature of the universe. Well, I would like to now offer a flashback even before Newton to this man, Kepler. Kepler thought the Earth was unique and its orbit was related to the other planets by nice mathematical ratios, the Greek regular solids. We now realize that there are zillions of stars, each with planetary systems, and that Earth's orbit is special only insofar as it's in the range of radii and eccentricities compatible with life. That may have disappointed Kepler, uh, but it was a vain quest to try and find a neat explanation of the Earth's orbit. And some of those who don't like the multiverse are thinking rather like that. They're disappointed that we can't uh, understand all the details. It would render the hope for neat explanations just as vain as Kepler's numerological quest to understand the solar system. But I would say that our preferences are irrelevant to the way physical reality actually is. And we should be open-minded to the possibility of a fourth and grandest Copernican revolution. We've had the Copernican revolution itself, then the realization that there are zillions of planetary systems in our galaxy, then that there are zillions of galaxies in the observable universe, and we may then realize that our observable domain is a tiny part of a far larger and possibly <coughs> diverse ensemble. And Andre Linde has uh, devised one of these. Were that the case, We'd live not in a typical part of the multiverse, but a typical domain in the subset, which allows some kind of complexity to develop. Now, to address that question further, we have to know about the physics at this extreme uh, high energy density, and moreover, the probability distribution of these fundamental numbers, if they vary, and the correlation between them. And that's a can of worms we certainly can't yet open. We will have to await huge theoretical advances. Because what's needed is a well corroborated theory which can describe physics at the inflationary era, trillions of times higher energy than the LSE can reach, and which can at the same time uh, um, give us uh, something that we can test at low energies. But about 10 years ago, I was here at Stanford on a panel chaired by Bob Kirshner, and Andre Linde was on the panel as well, and we were asked how much we bet on the multiverse concept on the scale, would you bet your goldfish, your dog, or your life? <laughs> and I remember this. Uh, I said I was almost at the dog level. And Andre Linde, who'd of course already spent 25 years on eternal inflation, he said he almost, he'd almost bet his life on this. Later on being told this, Stephen Weinberg said he'd happily bet 
Martin Rees's dog and Andre Linde's life. <laughs> you remember this, I Well, Andre Linde, my dog and I will all be dead long before this is settled. But it's not metaphysics, it's highly speculative, it's exciting science and it may be true. Just a few points in conclusion. If I want a logo for this entire research area, I choose this, an Ouroboros. It depicts the interconnectedness of the micro world on the left and the cosmos on the right, the inner space of atoms and the outer space of the universe. There are links between small and large, left and right. Our everyday world of life and mountains is determined by atoms and chemistry. Halfway up, stars are powered by fusion of nuclei inside those atoms, higher up still. There's another link because galaxies are seemingly held together by swarms of subnuclear particles that make up the dark matter. The left is the domain of the quantum. On the right-hand side, Einstein's theory holds sway. Now, general relativity and quantum theory are the two pillars of 20th century physics, but they haven't yet been meshed together into a single unified theory. In most contexts, this doesn't impede us because the domains of relevance don't overlap. Astronomers can ignore quantum fuzziness in the orbits of planets, and chemists can safely ignore gravitational forces between individual atoms in a molecule. But at the very beginning, everything was as it were squeezed so small that quantum fluctuations could shake the entire universe, sort of metaphorically speaking. And as I've said, to really understand what banged and why it banged, and whether there were indeed other big bangs, we need steps towards this synthesis. So the two fronts of physics, the very small on the left, very large on the right. But before leaving this picture, let me say that the richest variety plays out on the third frontier, the very bottom, the very complicated things, insects, people, and mountains. This is the most challenging frontier. This picture shows the famous flea drawn by Newton's least favorite scientist, Robert Hooke, a pioneer inventor of the microscope. And the point I want to make is that even an insect, with its layer upon layer of complexity, is harder to understand than a star where intense heat and compression by gravity preclude any complex chemistry. It may be topsy-turvy, but astronomers can speak confidently about black hole collisions a billion light years away, whereas theories of diet and childcare are notorious for their lack of consensus. But that's because our complex everyday world presents intellectual challenges just as daunting as those of the cosmos and the quantum. Understanding us human beings who are midway between atoms and stars in size are the most daunting things. Moreover, fundamental theory, even if we could achieve it, would offer zero help to most scientists. Calling it a theory of everything, as some popular books do, is hubristic and misleading. Biologists aren't held up by uncertainties in subnuclear physics. They're held up because the structures they're studying are very complicated. Well, that was an aggression to highlight the unity of science, plus a deferential gesture towards the 99% of scientists who are neither particle physicists nor cosmologists, and I suspect there are many of them here. But I'd like to end by zooming in from the universe, or even an ensemble of universes, to realities closer to the here and now. I'm often asked, is there a special perspective which astronomers can offer to science and philosophy? We view our home planet in a vast cosmic context, and in coming decades we know where there's life out there, etc. But I think the most significant insight we can offer is an awareness of the immense future. Let me explain. The stupendous time spans of the evolutionary past are now part of common culture maybe not in Kentucky, and not in parts of the Muslim world. <laughs> but most people who accept that picture somehow think we humans are the culmination of the evolutionary tree. And that hardly seems credible to an astronomer. Indeed, we're probably still nearer the beginning than the end. Our sun formed four and a half billion years ago. It's got six billion years 
before it flares up and dies, and the fuel runs out. And the expanding universe will continue, perhaps forever. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> so any creatures witnessing the sun's demise in five or six billion years hence, they won't be human. They'd be as different from us as we are from a bug. Because post-human evolution, here on Earth and far beyond, could be as prolonged as the evolution has led to us in the first life, and even more wonderful. And Darwin himself realized this, but future evolution will be faster than Darwinian, which it may happen on a technological time scale, driven by advances in genetics and AI. But my very final thought is that even in the context of a concertina timeline, extending billions of years into the future as well as into the past, this century is special. It's the first when one species, namely ours, has our planet's future in its hands. Our creative intelligence could inaugurate billions of years of post-human evolution, even more marvellous than what's led to us. On the other hand, humans could trigger bio, cyber or environmental catastrophes that foreclose all such potentialities. So our Earth, this pale blue dot in the cosmos, is a special place. It may be a unique place. And we're its stewards at a specially crucial era, the Anthropocene era. And that's, I think, a key message for us all, whether we're astronomers or not. And that's how I'll finish. Thank you very much. indeed, Martin, for a, a gloriously panoramic view uh, delivered, I emphasize, uh, on a uh, huge amount of jet lag, too. <laughs> so it's, uh, we treated us to um, the wit of a uh, great vision, wit and wisdom. And um, the, I think we, uh, there are bound to be some questions. Uh, be, be, just before we go there, I would like to say that this uh, lecture is being taped and you'll be able to get it probably in two or three days on the Kaipak website on, on, this, uh, on this site. It, um, and then for those, some people were here for an earlier lecture this week from Roger Penrose, and that I think is already up there. So I just sort of advertise those people want to look at, the, look at those particular sites. So let me now at this point call for questions for Martin. Um, I'm sure there must be. Oh, there, there, sir. So this is partially a scientific and philosophical question. So before the Big Bang, where did all this stuff of the galaxy and us come from? I think I'd like to let Andrea Linde answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Even Andrea Linde can answer yes. that question. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. the, the question is where the galaxy came from? Just all the stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> There are some strange theory, which is called inflationary theory, which looks like science fiction, and maybe it is, but we hope not. So, according to the theory, the universe started with some dense vacuum-like state, and the universe started expanding exponentially, growing and growing. And then, at some stage, quantum fluctuations start producing some small, small, small stuff. But because it was exponentially growing, the size of this small stuff Grow, was growing too, and eventually these uh, well, produced galaxies. Where the whole matter came, because it looks like cheating, that you start with practically nothing, and then suddenly you got something, and that everybody would be happy to have it, right? Okay. So apparently uh, there is something fishy about the concept of energy applied to the whole universe the total energy of the universe is equal exactly to zero, mm -hmm. being split into positive energy of matter and negative energy of gravity. And when the universe was rapidly expanding, then the energy of matter was exponentially growing, and energy of gravity was exponentially falling. But who cares about gravity? Okay, so that is the way how, well, I mean, Okay. <laughs> this is, this is our best one, okay, 
and what we see right now is like maybe seven or eight different evidences, observational evidences, which well uh, confirm uh, many different predictions of this weird theory. So we are actually think that it is not as weird as it might seem. <laughs> Thank you very much. to uh, a challenging question. So, more challenging questions. Uh, Professor Rees, welcome to the colonies. The <laughs> 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 Royal Air Force did for the whole world in 1940. Now, my question is, uh, is Super Lungan's uh, 1.4 solar masses, uh, I expect that anything larger than that collapses to a black hole. And presently reading a book by John Griffin that says that solar masses larger, up to four solar masses, can go through an internal helium flash and bounce back down into a main sequence situation and not turn into a black hole. Where am I in this day? Yes. Well, I'm not sure the detail, I'll say two things. Um, lots of stars do throw off lots of mass before they leave a white dwarf behind. Um, and also, I should mention that if anyone look carefully at the, um, the, the slide I showed of the nuclear free universe, you'll have seen that the Chandrasekhar mass was there, five solar masses, but that was because that was for pure hydrogen, not for helium. Um, and so, uh, in the nuclear free universe, all stars uh, uh, below five solar masses will deflate and become white dwarfs. No neutron stars. Thank you. Uh, yes, Andrew. Uh, the, the question is that you gave two apocalyptic numbers. One is the age of our sun when it is going to die in yes. six billion years. Yes. And another number was four billion years, uh, which is two billion years earlier. Andromeda will crash to our galaxy. <laughs> so whether the sun will have any time to die. Uh, <laughs> well, I can be I can be reassuring because um, when Andromeda hits our galaxy, it won't do very much because the uh, merged galaxy will have galaxy will have stars which are sort of twice as densely packed as now, but still very dilute. So the uh, the risk of a collision between our star and another star is very small. So so uh, we won't see the Milky Way as a disk. But it won't be at all catastrophic when the Andromeda uh, galaxy hits us. And I think that should be highly reassuring to everyone here. <laughs> there are other existential crises, but that's not on top of the list. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Um, given that matter warps space time, in the very early universe, would either matter or dark matter act as an observer while the universe expanded, or would it act? Um, well, when we work out the uh, expansion rate of when it accelerates or decelerates, the answer depends on the, the amount of matter and the form of matter. So you have to consider uh, material, whatever it's in, and, and uh, know what its density is, what its pressure is, in order to apply Einstein's equations, which tell you how the expansion goes. I'm not sure that answers your question, but, but uh, uh, the, um, uh, the equations of Einstein tell us how the expansion goes. It depends on what the matter is. Do, do you have any optimism that humanity might, in fact, discover a theory of everything? <laughs> um, well, it's presumptuous of me. Uh, I mean, I know there are some people who, uh, uh, who, who think it's... Uh, it's um, sort of uh, um, too bold to attack such a theory. I don't do that. I think we should admire people who devote their lives to this challenge, especially when they're among the people who we regard as the, uh, uh, the leading intellects in our subject in the world. Uh, it's great they're doing this. Um, but I think we have to accept that um, they may not succeed in the sense that uh, they may not come up with a unique theory uh, which can be um, related to any observation we can make. Because they can have some beautiful mathematics, but unless there is some observation in our observable world which it predicts and which gives 
corroboration to it, then we won't take it seriously. We don't know. Um, so I, I think all the people work on this theory, they hope that there will be some corroboration um, in either that it explains all the mysterious numbers of ordinary physics, or if it tells us new things about cosmology. We don't know. But I would like to just say that I think we do have to realize that there may be some aspects of reality which are just too hard for our brains to cope with. There's no particular reason why human brains should be matched to understanding all aspects of reality, um, any more than uh, a monkey can understand Newtonian physics. Um, and um, so we have to accept that there may be some problems, but uh, as I implied also, I think the most difficult problems may be not in physics, not even in string theory, but perhaps in understanding the brain or something of that kind. And I know Andrew Linde has himself said that understanding consciousness is something which should be part of science. Um, so so we should, I think we should hope that we can succeed. And if people are despairing, they will never even try. And we want them to try and solve these problems. There is an argument called the simulation <laughs> argument. Which, I'm sorry. There's an argument called the simulation argument, which I'm sure you've heard of, which is which is arrived at supposedly by rigorous logical reasoning, which, which vectors off in a completely different way than, say, the multiverse. I wonder if you regard that as a serious intellectual um, endeavor in the way that the multiverse, which is also, you know, highly speculative, do, is that something that should be considered as another possibility? Not on the same level. I will contest your view based on rigorous arguments. Um, but, I, but I think, just for the benefit of uh, uh, people who haven't heard about this, um, the, the argument there is that uh, we can imagine the far future that uh, um, alien intelligence would have bigger and bigger computers. They'd be able to make much, much better simulations, eventually simulating entire worlds, indeed simulating the whole world we happen to be in. And then the argument goes, uh, well, Perhaps that's what we are in. Perhaps we are a simulation, um, and that uh, the ground level of reality is somewhere which we don't appreciate. And so we are uh, in a sort of computer game, uh, which is being run by some deity or some superhuman entity. Um, and uh, so this, it's, it's, it's not something we can so easily rule out. I think if people take it seriously, there are two things you, that, that it implies. Uh, the first is that you should look for the glitches in the physical laws because they may not be able to simulate anything perfectly. And the other argument I've been given is that you should uh, have an interesting life because if they're watching you, then they'll pull the plug out. <laughs> they'll pull the plug out if, if they get bored. <laughs> so I don't take it very seriously. Um, well, when you say should, you're assuming you know some fundamental physics. And as I say, that, uh, uh, there are ideas. You're quite right in saying that the early universe has some favoritism of matter over antimatter by about one part in a billion. And most of the matter and antimatter annihilates, but there's a bit of matter which doesn't have a mate to annihilate with, as it were, is left behind. And that asymmetry is crucial. Um, and uh, uh, there are some ideas related to other kinds of asymmetries in physics, but uh, um, it, it is indeed one of the puzzles of physics. Back. Uh, yeah, shout you, very Do you think uh, dark energy can ever be harvested as a fuel source? Harvested as an energy source? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, um, I think we've got to understand it first. I mean, uh, uh, just to say, dark energy is a name for the, uh, uh, the energy latent in empty space, uh, which, as it were, pushes the universe into accelerating expansion. It overwhelms gravity on the uh, scale of, uh, uh, of, of uh, intergalactic matter because the density is so low. Um, again, and again, I speak with diffidence, but um, I, I think. Um, everyone accepts that we won't understand dark energy until we understand something like string theory. Because uh, many people would say that uh, just as I can't chop up this table indefinitely, I get down to scale of atoms, then so people would say that 
I can't chop up space or time indefinitely, and I will get down to a scale, and that's the scale which on that diagram I had is of points at the bottom left, uh, where, uh, where quantum fluctuations and gravity meet. And uh, that's the kind of scale on which the action in string theory is important, and uh, uh, on which what we think of as ordinary points in our three-dimensional space may be a tightly wrapped origami in extra dimensions. So that's a long way of saying that before we can understand the nature of the engine empty space, we will have to um, uh, understand uh, the nature of space in this uh, fundamental way. And the problem is that the scale on which this structure is basically to exist is a billion, billion times smaller than an atom. And so it's a big extrapolation. So I think to understand it um, is going to be a big, uh, a big challenge. Um, and uh, the energy in it is sort of very dilute. And of course, some, pe some people would say that, um, uh, that, that there are many different forms of vacuum states, um, and, uh, and the B may not be the lowest ones. And, and if you want to think about ap apocalyptic states, then the idea is that perhaps um, um, our empty space is like a sort of super cool liquid. And if you put in some impurity or disturb it in, in some way, then it will suddenly change into something else. Um, and uh, that would destroy the uh, the entire universe. Uh, this is something that has been talked about, and that's a, uh, it doesn't keep you awake at night, but that's a... <laughs> 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 uh, yes? During your career, um, you've worked in different fields, and you've been involved in different fields. Um, what's been the biggest surprise? Oh gosh, well, I mean, um, Roger's almost as old as me, so he can join in. <laughs> 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 so, so, he can, <laughs> yeah, so he can join this one. Um, well, I, I mean, I think what's been so gratifying is the rate of discovery, because uh, when I started, which was in the, uh, in the mid and late 1960s, that was exciting, which was the first evidence for the, the Big Bang, Angus Wilson, first evidence for quasars, first talk about black holes really existing, that was very exciting. Um, but um, uh, if you look at the last few years, we've had exoplanets, we've had gamma ray bursts and other new strange phenomena called radio bursts, we've had gravitational waves detected, it's just as exciting. So I, th I think it's been a wonderful subject to be in, and I recommend it to any of the younger people in the audience, um, uh, as a subject where new things are happening. And one advice I would give to any of the younger people in the audience is that if you're picking a subject, pick a subject where new things are happening, either new observations or new and better techniques. Because then you'll be able to do something which no one in the old generation had a chance to do. If you're in a stagnant subject, you'll be trying to do the problems the old guys got stuck on, and that, that's harder. Um, so I, I think astronomy is a good subject to get into because uh, new things are always happening. I can't identify one thing, but it's been a wonderful subject. When the history of science in this period is written, I think what's happened in astronomy and space will be one of the most exciting chapters. I, I would sort of second those views very much. I think when I was constitutional, uh, not so long ago, um, the, um, I never really expected the pace of discovery, which was still going on then, to last more than, say, a decade. I thought it would just all keep wrapping and subject to the plateau and become all the time for the rest of it. Quite the contrary has happened. There's no, no letter in the rate of discovery. And a lot of this has been fueled, in fact, by, by the, it's not just the problems, it's the application of technology. Use yes. telescopes, don't need the whole electromagnetic spectrum and beyond. You know, think, Groovy sensitivities by orders and orders of magnitude, and there's no sign right now of that te technology, um, cap technological capabilities uh, uh, running out either. So uh, again, for the young people, there's, there's still a great future yeah. in this astrophysics and cosmology. I think we've got just one or two more questions. Yeah, because say it's, it's, it's the technology of instruments on the ground in space, and also computer simulations, yeah. because we can't do experiments, so the computer simulations have, have been. So crucial, yeah. and uh, armchair theory doesn't get you very far by itself. Yeah. So, okay. so why haven't we discovered intelligent signals from space? Is it just uh, well, we don't. This, we, we don't know. In fact, uh, we spent the last two days just down the road at the conference on this sort of thing. Um, well, I mean, as you know, the, the one possibility is that. The emergence of intelligent life is very rare, even if simple life was, and so we haven't seen it. Or, or it doesn't last very long, 
or it transforms into something which uh, isn't conspicuous, we don't recognize, which doesn't want to communicate. So I think there are many, many options, we don't know, but, but I, I think it's a very good idea that we should actually search for uh, any kind of unexpected and artificial seeming uh, emissions from space, you know, some flashes in some funny patterns or some funny artifacts and things like that, because um, it's such a fascinating subject, and I think everyone will do this, and certainly, um, you know, if, if I'm on a plane and I uh, don't want to be disturbed, I tell my next door neighbor I'm a mathematician. <laughs> if I don't mind being disturbed, I say I'm an astronomer, but then the first question I'm asked is nearly always, do you think we're alone? <laughs> comment of that for those conspiratorial, of us, conspiratorial amongst you who think there's been some big cover-up. Uh, that <laughs> lot we've been we consorting with, they're capable of keeping secrets. <laughs> 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 the last question, sir. <laughs> Uh, yes, well, well, some are tighter than others. I mean, uh, gravity isn't very tight. The fluctuation amplitude isn't, isn't very tight. Um, uh, the, uh, the nuclear one is a bit, is a bit tighter. Um, and uh, the, the one which is normally regarded as being the tightest is the, um, the, the dark energy, what's called the, um, the lambda, which is the uh, a repulsive force uh, which accelerates the universe. Um, that's normally thought to be uh, very tightly determined because most theorists are surprised it's not much, much bigger. But I suspect that may change with some new theory. We don't know. But that's the one which most people would say is tightest. Uh, the rest are not specially tight. So, well, thank you very much, Martin, for having Thank you.